Hi, I'm Ann Kopf. Over the years, I often get the question, what was the arena fair? Now, I appreciate the sincerity and interest with which a question like this is asked, and it's not the question that bothers me, but what can you say? Well, because it frustrated me so much to try to answer it in one word or one sentence, I'm going to tell you what 13 College of Worcester students and I did the summer of 1961 when we started the Arena Fair. Basically, it is this. We initiated the newest kind of College of Worcester service project. The Scott Calendar listed this program simply as Arena Fair. It was the name we gave the summer theater we established in Worcester, Ohio, the summer of 1961. Arena refers to a type of staging, a theater in the round, in which the acting area is in the center and the audience sits on all four sides. The fair part comes from our theater's location in the Grange Building on the Worcester Fairgrounds, which was a 16-sided building normally used for the display of canned fruits during the Wayne County Fair. Before I go any further, I want to make clear the big difference between our project and the others. Although the 13 members of our company were all either students at or recent graduates of the College of Worcester, we were not sponsored by the college and the college was not technically responsible for either the success or failure of the venture. However, whether we liked it or not, in the eyes of many of the townspeople and the college faculty, we were students and were really representing, if not the college as a whole, at least the college's little theater once located in Taylor Hall. May I say that with a few exceptions, everything any of us knew about theater, we learned there. The simple fact that we were able to make it without adult supervision is proof that we had gotten a basic foundation of theatrical knowledge working in production in the college's little theater during the school year. And were it not for this knowledge and encouragement we received, we could never have started the arena fair at all. You might wonder how these things begin. Well, all it takes to do something like this is a couple of screwballs to get the idea and some more boneheads to stand behind them and help them do it. You might as well know it. These type of screwballs were actually enrolled at the College of Worcester in the early 1960s. Anyway, in March of 1961, Barb Cernick and I saw an ad in the Theater Arts magazine about a summer theater for sale in Cape Cod. To most people, this would just be another ad, and they might glance at it and turn the page. But right here, you can see the difference between us and other people. We actually believed that we could get the $4,500 down payment, get a company together, and go there and put on plays. This just goes to show you that if you haven't got any common sense when you come here, that's one thing Worcester won't teach you. Well, we actually wrote the folks in Cape Cod and asked about the theater. And while waiting for an answer, we stirred up some interest in a summer theater among our friends. When we received a letter saying that we were one of four groups they had heard from that sounded like a reliable organization, we began to think there was something fishy about the whole thing, but might have had something to do with the fact that we also had not put together the $4,500. But by this time, the thing had begun to snowball, and we began to look around for another location. Then before we knew it, it was May, and we still had no money and no building. So we decided to look at Worcester for several reasons. First, we could start working on the project before school was out. Second, we could rent a badly needed equipment from the college's little theater. And third, we felt there were enough people in town who would show an interest in productions during the winter that we would have a built-in audience to begin with. One day, we saw this building down at the fairgrounds, and to all of us, it looked like just what we wanted. So we rented it from Walter Bates, a local car dealer, who had rented it from the fair board to store cars, and he moved his cars out for us, and we paid him our $35 a month rent, and it was ours for the summer. Those members of the company who could swing it pitched in money, and $500 backing came from a hopeful, faithful friend. By June, school was out and we were on our way. We moved into two houses on College Avenue. Mr. Flattery, our landlord, was 91 years old at the time and seemed pretty well satisfied with us. 
Now, I won't go into any details about our living conditions, but may I say that living together as we did that summer, with the common objective and learning to work together on what was often a 24-hour basis, was for many of us the greatest educational experience of our lives. Now, don't misunderstand me. I have very few complaints about life at Worcester, but we all know you can't learn all about life at college. We saw another side of life, where men and women were forced to look beyond the individual achievements of high grades or college awards and focus as a group on the end product, the play. The goal towards which all personal efforts were directed. Actors painted the floor, floor painters made costumes, and everybody did what needed to be done to reach that goal. In case I don't get all their names worked in later, I'd just like you to know who the members of the group were. Liz Lutz and Louise Tate, Bill Thompson, Bill Skelton, Bill Tanner, Chuck Livermore, Judy French, Barb Cernick, Jean Robinson, Barb LaSalle, Kathy McElroy, Brooke Cresswell, and me, Ann Kopp. As soon as we had moved into our residences, the big push toward June 29th, our scheduled first show opening night was on. It was a frenzy of activity. During those three weeks, we constructed platforming for the seats, masked the seating area off with burlap, set up two dressing rooms, put down a ground cloth, built a set, sold tickets, advertised, got ads for the programs, and rehearsed anti-mame. The three directors, Bill Thompson, Bill Skelton, and myself, held tryouts for townspeople for parts we couldn't fill. Bit by bit, things began to take shape. A thousand and one things we had never thought of had to be dealt with. Insurance, federal income tax, getting seating plans okayed in Columbus, tickets to be printed, a concession stand, and so on. On June 28th, at almost midnight of the day before we were scheduled to open, we finally began to paint the set. The thing about theater in the round is that you can't do a halfway job. People all around the stage notice detail. That night, from 12 to 3 a.m., I painted little Pennsylvania Dutch designs on two bar stools. At about 5.30 a.m., we began painting the floor, and what a floor it was. Chuck Livermore, who designed it, was on everybody's blacklist that day, for it was squares, black and white, two-foot square squares, all over the floor. But we all had to admit, once it was done, that it made the set. It gave it class and made the acting area seem much larger. When we finally finished, we had a theater which seated 189 people, and we opened with Auntie Mame that night to a full house. Judy French, who played the part of Auntie Mame, was cool and calm and accomplished her many costume changes in a matter of seconds. The people laughed, they applauded, and we went home that night, a tired but proud and happy group. We ran our shows from Thursday through Monday night at $1.25 a ticket Thursday, Sunday, and Monday, and $1.50 a ticket Friday and Saturday. We generally rehearsed the next scheduled show for a week before it opened during the mornings and afternoons, and gave the current show in the evenings. Then on Tuesday and Wednesday nights, we'd dress rehearse the show opening on Thursday. On the 4th of July, we thought we'd really pull in the holiday crowds. But we forgot about a long-standing Worcester tradition. There are about 12,000 people in Worcester in 1961. Well, 11,980 went to the fireworks show held at the College Stadium, and 20 people came to see us. The other six members of the audience were parents of the people in the cast. 26 was our lowest attendance figure for the season. The week after Auntie Mame, we opened The Mousetrap a thriller by Agatha Christie, in which, by the way, the college's own Dr. Gore played Major Metcalf. The favorite show for many of us was Garson Kanan's Born Yesterday, in which John Weckesser did a fine job as Harry Brock. The brown and gold plaid floor we had for that one is Barb Cernick's claim to fame. We were very fortunate to get furniture for that show and for Bell Book and Candle from Maybaugh's Furniture Company in Sterling, Ohio. Born Yesterday is also remembered by us for being the first on-stage Big Kiss scene show. 
During rehearsals, Brooke Cresswell and I would go into our clinch near the end of the first act, and in order to get it just right, Bill Skelton, our director, would say, Good, now hold. 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, okay, break. We had seven second ones, three second ones, oh, and any old number, really. It was mighty hard not to break up laughing right in the middle of one of those onstage kisses. After Born Yesterday, we were forced to take a week off and recover. We were afraid this break might hurt us, but as it turned out, the next show, Charlie's Aunt, led the season in attendance figures. With the first two performances sold out to service clubs, Bill Skelton, director of Auntie Mame, Born Yesterday, and Bell Book and Candle, carried off the role of Lorne Fancourt Baberly to the delight of reviewers, cast, and audiences. Bell Book and Candle, which followed Charlie's Aunt, was quite a change of pace for us. We finished off the season with Our Town, in which Jeannie Robinson played Emily and Brooke Cresswell played George, with John Weckeser as the stage manager. Despite its simplicity, Our Town is a challenging and rewarding classic and was well adapted to theater in the round by Bill Thompson's direction and Chuck Livermore's set. When the lights dimmed for the last time on August 17, 1961, there was hardly a dry eye in the dressing rooms afterward. We tore the place apart in three days, stored our lumber under the grandstand at the fairgrounds, had a farewell party, and went our separate ways. But the actual productions we put on are only part of the story. The life we led was unique. At the beginning of the summer, we got up at 7.30 a.m., but this gradually got later as the summer progressed. We had three cars to transport us back and forth to the fairgrounds. Liz Lutz's 1960 Impala, Weckesser's Renault, and The Bomb. The Bomb is the affectionate nickname we gave to a 1951 Chevy we bought at the beginning of the summer from Carl Braden down on Liberty Street for $65. While $65 may sound like a steal, it was a good thing it was all downhill to the fairgrounds, or we never would have been able to rolling jumpstart it every morning. Mealtimes were quite hectic. Breakfast was segregated, the men downstairs, the girls upstairs, and lunch and dinner were prepared by our guardian angel, Kathy McElroy, who performed miracles on $60 a week. We all ate in a room 8 feet by 12 feet in size, sitting on the floor or wherever you could find a seat, everybody shoveling it down and jabbering nervously before a showtime. Then there were those other meal times when faculty members or townspeople invited the whole company over for dinner. These people really deserve some kind of an award because we'd come about 5.30 p.m. in our grubby work clothes and have to leave at 6.30 for the theater. We'd eat and run. I also remember, and I hope Dick Noble will forgive me for advertising this fact, but his family had a swimming pool in his backyard and invited us out for a dip whenever we could come. It was these short breaks like that which helped us keep our sanity that summer. Another person to whom we owe a great deal is Grace Hansel of Durstein's Beauty Salon. We must have had 250 to $300 worth of work done there, and let me tell you, it was work. I had a variety of colors. Judy French had, for an example, blonde, brown, pink, and gray. Brooke Cresswell had a haircut, and Bill Thompson had a permanent. Additionally, Robert Critchfield donated his law services to us. Others loaned us clothes and properties and told their friends about us. We couldn't have done it without the help of numerous people, and we all came to feel that Worcester is a pretty nice town with a lot of warm, friendly, and interesting people in it. As I look back on that summer, I see many things we did well and many things we could have done differently. We knew before we started that generally a new theater doesn't make money. However, we took in $6,000 at the box office, and with the help of our backing and a gift from one of Worcester's citizens, we were able to pay all our bills and have a tidy sum in the bank besides. It's pretty difficult for me to tell you just what we got out of that summer, for it meant a lot of different things to different people. For some, it meant a decision to make theater a career. For others, a decision not to. But I spoke earlier of a common objective, a group working together toward doing something worthwhile. For that reason, I speak today not for myself, but for 13 students who found working together that summer a creative experience they will always remember.
Thank you for all the memories.